um, it can be canceled or not. And we set associated with the button an on-click listener that says if they've clicked OK to go ahead and tell the tell the doodle view to clear itself. Otherwise, we do nothing. We just we just um, make the dialog disappear. So that's the shake part of this one. I think the important part of this to summarize the shake part is that one of the great things about developing mobile applications is that there are ways for users to interact with them beyond the kinds of interactions you get with the desktop computer. So there's a touch screen. That's the one different interaction. But in addition, there's, there's actually shaking it. And if it makes sense, then, you know, go and, you know, put that sort of functionality in here. Anyone that's played with an Etch-a-Sketch would get that if you shake this, you make the image disappear. So it's a very intuitive sort of gesture uh, to do this. Like any other thing, we need um, a listener to handle the code. So once we've, we've pointed to that accelerometer through our sensor manager, we have to define a listener for it and then write our code to do what we need to do. All right. Let's look briefly at our menus, and I don't think the menus will be anything earth-shattering here. Here is our creating the menu option. That gets invoked when? That gets invoked when we ask for the menu. And the menu in this application is up here. So if we click on that, those three dots, whoops. click on these three dots, we get our menu's worth of options. Now, depending on the version of Android you have, that menu can appear and work a couple different ways. In this particular one, the menu looks like that. In Here we're adding our selections for the color, the width, erase, and so on. So these are, this is what happens when we define the menu, display the menu. We then go in and create different actions based on the menu selection that is picked. For the color and the width, we display a dialog. So notice that it says show color dialog show with a uh, line with dialog. For the other things, we simply invoke some methods on the doodle view. For example, um, if we say that we want an eraser, what we do is we effectively we set the color, the drawing color to white. If we were going to expand this, because all the drawings in this example, you're drawing on a white background. If we wanted to expand this to um, allow different backgrounds, so that maybe you could pick a red or a green or whatever background, then what we'd do is we'd set the drawing color to the background color if we wanted to do an erase. So if we were drawing on a red background and we wanted to do a erase, we'd make our drawing uh, brush be red. If they click clear, we call the doodle view clear event. If they click save image, we call the doodle views save image method. Here's our dialogues.
again, the seek bar is a nice new addition to our palette of things. I'm not sure. We might have used it before. But I think we did, actually, with the tip, now that I think about it. But we're following the formula. We're grabbing pointers to those elements. You know, we create our dialog and set the content view. We bring in the XML for that, set the title, set all these things. We grab pointers to those seek events, and we set listeners for all of those things. So we set a listener for the alpha seek bar, we set a listener for the red seek bar, and so on down the line. We initialize the seek bars to their current value. So in other words, if, if we're already, uh, you know, if we're already at, you know, 100% for red, we set the red over to 100%. And then finally, we set a listener for the button when we want to finalize those changes. Let's back up for a second. One thing that you'll notice is that for all four of those seek bars, we set the same listener. We set the same on seek bar change listener to that color seek bar changed. All right. How do you suppose that method is going to know what to change? In other words, if I use the same listener for the alpha, for the red, for the blue, and for the green, how is that listener going to know which seek bar I made the change to? Any idea? Because for all these, we're calling the same, we're saying the same listener. We're saying the color <coughs> seek bar changed listener. So how does that method know? Well, let's take a look. It knows because Actually, I stand corrected. It does know, but it, it ignores it. This is kind of an interesting little snippet of code. It knows which seat <coughs> bar got changed because it gets past an argument of the seat bar. So if we really wanted to, we could look and test um, the value of the, of the seat bar, find out was it the alpha, was it the red, was it the green, was it the blue. But we don't even bother with that. Why not? Because instead, what we do is we just say, we're going to reset everything. So it doesn't matter. Every time this fires off, three of the seat bars will have remained the same, and we're sort of setting, resetting the variable for nothing. But one of them has changed, and we change the values of the instance variable for the color based on that. So let's say, for example, I change the red. All right. Now that red seek bar would get passed in as that seek bar argument, but as I said, we're ignoring it. What are we doing instead? We're going and we're grabbing the value of every seek bar. Now. The alpha seek bar would be unchanged, right? Because we changed the red, not the, not the alpha. So this is going to give me the exact same value that it did before. The red's going to be different, so this will give me a new value. The green, the blue, and all that are all going to be the same value as before. We then set the background color of that color view. If you remember from the XML, we said that the color is previewed by having a control that we set the background color to. And that's what we're doing here. Now we can we can come to some 
conclusions about how that seek bar change listener works. If I look at the color, as I move it, the color changes. So in other words, it doesn't wait until I'm done with the slide, all right? Any change in it, that change listener fires off. And it will change the color of this little view here on the screen. It will change the background color of it. And again, as I said, every time I scroll this, three of them stay the same. Well, so what? So it just gives the same value it had before for it. But the one that changes is reflected when we draw this. Let's try to get through the other dialogue today, and then we'll look at the um, doodle view next time. All right. Finally, we have the on-click listener for the button that kind of finalizes everything. The show line width works similar. If they've picked from the menu to edit the line width, this pops up a dialog box. We get pointers to all those things, and we set the progress based on the current values of that. We then effectively create a little bitmap that we're going to draw on. We'll talk more about canvases and bitmaps and all that next time. But essentially, a bitmap is an image. It's, it's literally a map of bits. In other words, you have your pixels on a screen, it's a record of the value of what each of those pixels are. The canvas is the mechanism by which you can change a bitmap. So I could, for example, bring in an image of me, and that would be the bitmap. All right? If I wanted to draw a mustache on me, I could use a canvas to manipulate that bitmap. So we're drawing a bitmap here. All right? We then go, and based on the value of that um, slider, whatever that's called, scan bar, we go and we set the width, we grab the width of that, and we set our little paintbrush, this paint object is a paintbrush, to have the color of the appropriate color, to have sort of a rounded cap on the end of it, if you notice as I draw this in the dialog, for line width, notice the corner, or not the corner, but the end points are little rounded things. That's what this does. And then finally, we set the stroke width based on the progress. In other words, based on the point that this is on the seat bar. 50 being all the way over here, all the way down to 1 is the starting value. So 1 pixel all the way over through 50 width. And then we go and we draw a line on the canvas. That will change the bitmap. Because remember, the canvas is sort of the thing that you draw on to change the bitmap. Finally, we set this image's width, oh, I'm sorry, we set this image's view oops, to the bitmap that we drew. So, to carry this through, as I move this, 
I create a bitmap object. I also create a canvas object that will allow me to draw on that bitmap. I grab the parameters from this dialog for the width and from elsewhere in the application for the color. I then draw on the canvas a line of the appropriate width of the appropriate color with the rounded edges. I then go and take that bitmap and make it the image associated with this view right here. If you remember back in the XML, that was an image view. And that's how we, that's how that dialog works. When we're all done and we click on that, we simply go and we set our instance variables for the appropriate value of the width. What we'll do next time is we'll look at the objects used for drawing in more detail. That is the canvas, the bitmap, and the paint. We might revisit the dialog or we might just look at the doodle view part of it because a big part of the doodle view is going in and drawing on the canvas um, and then storing that bitmap. Those are the three objects that are used though in drawing. All right. The paint, which is effectively your paintbrush. All right. You can set the color, you can set the size of it, you can set the how the endpoints are of that, and you can set the opacity of it. The canvas is the thing that you draw on. The bitmap is sort of the end result image. And then finally, the view is the display of that image on the tablet so that people can see. So we'll go through that part of it on Wednesday. Questions? All right, we'll see you over in the lab.